Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Max. I'm an alcoholic, and um, oh yeah, there's that spotlight thing. We've got to get rid of that, Max. Uh, <laughs> don't like to see my own face. Um, as I was sitting, getting ready for this meeting, um, I actually can't quite believe that I'm sitting here. Um, about four years ago, yeah, four years ago, 2018, April 2018. Um, was the first time that I entered Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and people that know me will know that I share this all the time, that I didn't really enter of my own free will. Um, I was dragged by the hair by my younger sister, um, who knew I had a problem with alcohol. I knew I had a problem with alcohol, but I didn't have the desire to stop drinking. Um, I actually didn't stop drinking um, until... Much later than my first um, meeting um, during November 2019. And I have such admiration um, for those individuals that introduced themselves um, in having only a number of days because I wasn't able to get days by myself. I wasn't able to get an hour by myself in the end without alcohol and had to be locked up for three and a half months. Um, to be removed from the world, to be able to stop drinking. At that, in that late November, um, much like Bill W's story, towards the end of that late November in 2019, I was doomed to an alcoholic death. And I was in this absolutely ridiculous position where I was drinking to live and drinking to die. It just didn't make any sense. But I now understand that I suffer from this allergy. Um, that I have no control over. Um, and to be sitting here talk about, talking about four and five, for me, I know the term miracle is used quite a lot in the rooms, but it genuinely is for me a miracle that I'm sitting here this evening being able to talk very honestly about the fact that I have recovered from this hopeless state of mind and body and the reason why I failed for the many times before I started to try was because I did not complete four and five as per the clear cut directions. I now understand that this book that is honestly the most precious possession that I have, the basic text to which our fellowship is named after, is where I go to for all of the answers to the illness that I suffer from. I need look no further for any authentication. It answers every question in relation to my illness. And I've got a friend who's taught me how to dance through these pages. And what I'm going to do is try and take us on a little bit of a quick step through the pages in the first instance to get us to four and five. Because the illusion that I had, the delusion even, that I had when I first came into the rooms was I read those scrolls on the wall that Rachel read out so beautifully with the 12 steps on them. And I read them and I thought, well, I've done them. <laughs> I've read them off the wall. I know what those things mean. And then I hopped and I skipped and I jumped in and out over and above them. I didn't actually go through those steps properly, following the clear cut directions that are set out in such masterly detail in the pages. And <clears throat> I thought that I could just do four and five just like that. But the important thing for anybody new that's about that hasn't started the steps or anybody that's been about a long time and hasn't done the steps, that hasn't got a sponsor, that hasn't worked 164 pages before you get to actually step four and step five, there's so much that is given to us by the first 100 men and women as to the essential reasons why, the vital reason why we have to do and complete step four and five. I've been through my steps again recently for a second time and I have to put my hand on my heart and say that four and five are the most precious steps for me because they have enabled me to see what God wants me to be. And 
being able to see what God wants me to be makes me more useful to you, makes me more useful in life, and enables me to practice these principles that have been given to me in all of my affairs. I'm guided by a God of my understanding that I only found through the pages of this precious book. I understand that lack of power was my dilemma and only where I can find this power is in this book. That is the main purpose of this book. So if you're sitting in the meetings and you're not doing the steps and you're not reading this book with a sponsor, then I don't know what to say other than get a sponsor, work the program like the desperation of a drowning man like it tells us to do and everything will change. So let's dance through the pages. The first thing that always jumps out at me is the fact that in the doctor's opinion, it tells us his opinion, his actual opinion is that the subject that is covered in this book is paramount, is of supreme importance to anyone that's afflicted with alcoholism. That's his opinion. And at the end of the doctor's opinion, he says to us that he earnestly advises every alcoholic to read this book through. And although you might become here to scoff, you may remain to pray. I was a person that came to scoff and looked down on everybody and thought I knew better. And now I remain to pray. I came into the rooms and had all of these things that Dr. Silkworth talked about in terms of human problems, piling up in them and becoming it astonishingly difficult to solve. That was me. And this was just the beginning of this book. This is just the talking about the allergy and so on. Your sponsor will work this through with you and get you through these pages so that you understand it in greater detail. Going into Bill's story, I, I recognize myself and I could identify with his thinking, drinking, and feelings because, as he described, no words could tell of the loneliness and despair I found in the bitter morass of self-pity, quicksand stretched all around me. I met my match. I'd been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. Alcohol was my master. My feelings and my emotions were my master at the time when I first came into the rooms. Bill goes on to say that during his lifetime, and even when he was talking about religion um, when Evie Thatcher came to speak to him about the solution that was given to him by Roland Hazard and Zebra Graves, that he decided that in that per um, process that he had adopted those things which seemed convenient and not too difficult, the rest he disregarded. That's what I did with the steps when I first came into the rooms. I chose the ones that were easiest, the rest I disregarded. And so it goes on. In Bill's story, we're introduced to a summary of the steps. And it, uh, with regards to four and five, he says, my schoolmate, who's Abby Thatcher, visited me and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. That's where he sits and he talks with a friend about his step five. In relation to step four, we learn already on page 13 that he ruthlessly faced his sins and became willing to have my new friend, found friend, take them away, root and branch. I have not had a drink since. He's talking about step four there. We get down to the root causes of what our problem is. Now, much of this may not be making much sense if you're new around, but this is the purpose of a sponsor bringing you through the pages because they will break this down word for word, line for line, and make it so accessible to you that you won't be able to make any mistakes. I made the mistakes because I didn't do what was suggested. And the first 100 are really, really good in our program, really good in the book and telling us the truth. They tell us the truth at every junction of the way. And there is a solution. They say, yes, there is a solution. But they tell us that they didn't like doing this four and five either. They didn't like it. They tell us almost none of us liked the self-searching, the leveling of our pride the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. They didn't like it. I hated it. I hated it with a passion. But having come through the other end of it, and with my sponsor taking the fear away from it, and understanding why we do it, 
it just became this beautiful, prayerful exercise that enabled me to see who I was. And so it continues. You know, in, in page 25, the first 100 talk about the fact that their life was becoming impossible. They could go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of their intolerable situation with the unmanageability of their life, or they could accept the spiritual help. And ultimately, that's what had to happen with me. I had no other alternative. The grape persuader, that being alcohol, took me down and faced with alcoholic destruction, I had no other option than to accept the spiritual help. Carl Jung talks about this vital spiritual experience, this life-giving spiritual experience, where he talks about the fact that ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once the guiding forces of these lives of these, of these men, are suddenly cast to one side, and a new set of conceptions and motives are given to them. Notice that it's conceptions and motives that are given to them not the feelings and not the emotions, because what I've started to learn is that this is no longer about my feelings and my emotions. They were the guiding forces throughout my entire life, and that's where I got into trouble. And again, it continues. We go into the most beautiful chapter, We Agnostics, and there we find out <laughs> a non-stop course as to why we should believe or be willing to believe in this God of our own understanding. It never stops giving us the reason why we should find this power greater than ourselves. It tells us that leaving aside the drink question, because by this stage, I know that I'm alcoholic. I've self-diagnosed myself. I understand I'm powerless. I've admitted, I've let the idea in that I'm powerless over alcohol, that my life has become unmanageable. And as I move into step two, I'm coming to believe that this power greater than myself can restore me to sanity around alcohol. I leave the drink question aside and the first 100 men and women show me in precise detail how they were making hard going of life, how I was making hard go of life, how my life had become so unmanageable and all of the blocks that I had been creating. They talk about the fixed ideas that I had and how I was holding on to them as my solution, when in actual fact, as we keep on turning the pages, I could readily throw away the gadget that was of no use to me. So why wouldn't I believe that this God greater than myself could help me throw away the old ideas that I had, which weren't working, in order to recreate my life? This program for me is not about not drinking. It's about a way of living now. It truly has enabled me to recreate my life with the power of God, running through it every single time. In We Agnostics, it talks about the, the things that are the tissue of which our lives were constructed. Over the years, my life was constructed layer over layer over layer, block over block over block of what I thought I knew, where I thought I ruled the world. And as we move into the end of We Agnostics, we get some little fleeting moments where we start to talk about four and five. They talk about the fact that sometimes we had to search fearlessly. We don't search fearfully. We search fearlessly. We go into this with this prayerful exercise that enables us to search diligently. They tell us that they can only sweep the ground a bit. They can only sweep away our prejudice a bit. They encourage us to search diligently. Deep down within ourselves, we know now that that's where God may only be found, but we need to go deep down in ourselves to get rid of the blocks that have been stopping us from experiencing the sunlight of the spirit. And that some of these we balked, I balked the whole way through. At some, and and, and it, when I started to do four and five, back in the early days of being in the rooms, I just didn't do it properly. I couldn't let go, absolutely. And why are we to do this? We're making this decision to hand our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Because 
You see, I was the actress running the show and that had to stop. I had to quit playing God. He became the director. I became the agent. He became the father. I became the child. All I had to do was trust. All I had to do was keep on turning the pages and having faith in this process because I could see all of these other people around me where this solution had worked. But because of my fixed ideas, I thought I knew better. And in the end, I had no other alternative other than to trust what you guys were telling me, what the first 100 men and women were telling me. And when I took that third step, I didn't know what was going to happen. A lot of the times through this process, I just didn't know what was happening at any given moment in time. And now I can reflect back on things and think, oh, wow, that's the reason why I was doing that. That's the reason why that was happening. And it's only by helping other alcoholics and passing this message on that I learn more about this, that I can become more and more useful. And also that I understand more and more why I have to continue doing these steps and continue to take this inventory for the rest of my life. Because you see, by doing four and five, I thank God from the bottom of my heart when I've completed it that I know him better. So I've got this little thing here. I'm going to share. Um, I hope this works. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to, I can't see. Uh, let me see. Okay. So we're going into step four. And if you can see, this picture. Um, I hope this works. Um, so, when you take your se your step three prayer, you're handing your will. You're making the decision to hand your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand Him. You then launch into this vigorous course of action. And the reason why I put that image up there is this is how it actually feels. Um, and for me, when a rocket launches from that launch pad, if you imagine the noise, if you imagine the change in the atmosphere, if you imagine those astronauts stra strapped in for dear life, having faith that those engines are going to get them to the destination that they need to be in, strapped in, safe and protected. And that the emotions that they feel, that every part of their body is probably tensing, a little bit of fear, a little bit of anxiety, wondering what the hell is going to happen when they get to that outer universe, wherever they're going to head. And that's what it feels like when we launch into this process. It becomes noisy. It becomes uneasy. It becomes quite frightening. But ultimately, what we need to do is to make sure that we are vigorous in our approach to this. And if anybody has their big book with them, I'd encourage you to go to page 64 because the clear cut directions are set out and it says as in a, um, a definite, as an example, that's set out on page 65. So when we launch into this, the noise and all of that might consume you. You might think I can't do this. You might be full of fear. But you're now in this prayerful exercise, which doesn't end until you get to step seven. The amen in the prayer doesn't come until step seven. So all the way through, you're in the loving presence of the God of your understanding, that sense of love, power, direction. This is what you learn about all the way up to this point. I now understand that alcohol was but a symptom. I had to get down to the causes and the conditions. Like when my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, the lump that she had was the symptom of what lay beneath. We had to get down to the causes and the conditions to understand what her prescription, her chemotherapy or radiotherapy would have been. If the same applies with my prescription for alcohol, the alcohol is removed. It is but a symptom of what is actually going on underneath, what's going on deep down inside me. I had another little slide, but I'm not going to bother with it because I can't work it all out. But the next slide was going to be um, a cave. 
because we're going on a searching, fearless moral imagery of ourselves. We have to get down deep inside these dark crannies of ourselves into these caves to search out these causes and the conditions. At this point, I know I'm selfish and self-centered. Um, and I go on this fact-finding and fact-based submission. Again, this is not an emotional exercise. It may feel like that to you, but this is a very business-like inventory where we highlight, as it says, on those three columns, who you're resentful at, the cause of that resentment, and how it affects you. Resentment is the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anything else. I have to ask myself why I'm angry. These resentments are the spiritual malady, the third part of our illness, the first being the physical, the second being the mental obsession, the third being the spiritual malady. And I don't straighten out physically and mentally until I have dealt with the spiritual malady being the resentment. We've got seven categories, if you like, as to how I am affected by the things that have happened. But those three columns show I have to make the list as to who I'm resentful at. By this stage, I've got hundreds of people, institutions, and principles on my list. I mean hundreds of them. Because I've just entered this world where God is helping me through this process. And I go through each one and I ask the question, God, show me who I'm resentful at. I ask myself, what it's important to note there on page 64, we asked ourselves why we were angry. It's me that's angry, not God. I ask myself why I'm angry and I write down exactly why I'm angry. Not you did, you said, no, exactly why I am angry. This is my inventory to take, not anybody else's inventory to take. And then how this affects me. So there's the seven categories. If anybody wants to know the definitions of those, I'll put my email on at the end of this or and my telephone number. I'll be more than willing to help you guys. But I look at my pride, what I think you think of me. I look at my self-esteem, what I think of myself, my personal relationships, that's my interactions with, with more than two people, my sex relations, my pocketbook, um, my security, which is anxiety and fear, and one more, which I can't remember off the top of my head, ambitions, yes my desire for rank or fame. So I address all of those seven things, looking at myself in the way that it is said out there. And the other thing I do is I bracket those things that are affected me in terms of what, what drives my fear. And in any given point with that person, principal or institution where I feel fear, because that's important when we go into the fear inventory, because your resentment inventory is just the first part of this beautiful process. Um, I can't believe we're getting so excited about this. My sponsors, well, I don't even know whether they're here or not, but they're probably thinking, yeah, this girl, if you had a known what she was like, <laughs> just crazy that I'm sitting here talking about this. But anyway, it is, it is a life-changing thing to do, and I would encourage anybody that hasn't done it um, to go through it as is. Alcoholics Anonymous, not the worksheets, not this book, that book, this book, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's so important because in order for me, I take my responsibility, the AA pledge, really, really seriously. I am responsible for whenever anybody reaches out to hand for help, I am responsible for handing over the message of Alcoholics Anonymous in its, in its purest form. It's my responsibility. And the interesting thing about that resentment, um, those three columns, this is my truth. This is this is what is ha that this is what my reality is in here in my mind. It's my grudge list. These are all of the people I have these little grudges with. That's the reality as we see it now. But as we turn the page into 66, I call this the death threat page because on here there's about six or seven different death threats or really strong words if you like. The tell is Having left aside the drink question, why it's so important to do this inventory, otherwise the drink thing will come back again. These resentments are poison, it tells us in these pages. Before I get into that, it also says to us here that um, when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The other little picture I had was a, a boat, a beautiful boat tied up in a harbour. Now, this beautiful boat has somewhere to go, 
and it has a job to do, whether that be a fishing trip or whether that be taking some tourists on an excursion. But it's not doing its work well if it's tied up to the harbour. And that's exactly what happens with me and my resentments. If I'm tied up and harboured by these resentments, I can't be free or released to do God's work well. I can't be free to be useful to other people. So I want to be rid of these resentments. They're poison. And what I experienced in the most recent times of doing this inventory is that with my resentments, I was the judge, the jury, and the executioner. If I had a resentment against you, I wanted to control the show. I wanted to call you out. I wanted to take you down because I knew better. I was drinking the poison and wanting you to die. It just doesn't make any sense. And as I go through this, I now start to see things from an entirely different angle. I see these three columns. I see the resentments. I see the reason why I have them. I see the reason how it affected me. And I now have to look at it from an entirely different angle because that is the key to my future. It tells us that at the bottom of page 66. I now understand that these resentments are fatal. They're poison. This futility of life, this absolute pointlessness in life. I had to master these. I had to get rid of them. And this was my course. So I go out on another course of action. Remember that these people may be spiritually sick as well, but not forgetting the fact that currently I uh, have the spiritual malady that I need to be rid of. And in looking at this from an entirely different angle, I start to look at my dishonesty, my self-seeking. Um, my self-seeking, my dishonesty, <laughs> my selfishness, my fear. I look at my wrongs, my blames, my mistakes, my faults. I start to see that what was in my mind, what was on my grudge list, my reality is so far from what actually is, is going on and what needs to happen, that this fault in the middle, this blame in the middle. When, when, when an earthquake happens in the world, basically what happens is that there's a loss of continuity in the land and the sea. It separates. And that's what happened with me. I, what I identified in my, in my inventories was, I wanted you to love me, but I had to keep running away because I couldn't cope. I wanted to be your friend, but I had to keep running away because I wasn't good enough. This loss and continuity in my thought process was the fault that needs to be filled with God. And I won't get into the whole detail of the difference between blames, mistakes and all of that. It doesn't really matter. As long as you're doing what is suggested here, you will start to see this loss in continuity to be really able to look and see where this lack of power is our dilemma and that we need God's help with this. I then move into this fear inventory and understand that self-reliance, I've spent all my life in self-reliance and now it becomes about having this God reliance. Understanding that I have to trust this infinite power rather than my finite self. That I actually have courage to do this, to do this and trust in God is a courageous exploration, a courageous discovery. Men have faith, have courage. Through the ages, they've told us that. And once I start to identify these fears, I start to outgrow the fear. Like a little potted plant, you know, when you're at school and you're taught how to grow, I don't know, watercress or something, and it starts off in a little pot. And then as the roots grow stronger, you put it into another pot so it gets bigger, and then another pot, so you've got a bigger plant. Well, ultimately, that's what happens with my fears. I experience the fear. I understand that it's self-reliance. I then know I need to have God reliance. So the next time I have that fear, I go it. I can take on more. I can deal with more. All because I have this God reliance rather than my finite self. And I love the way the first 100 move into, now about sex. Just this lovely little subject that nobody likes to talk about here in Belfast, and certainly not Miss Margaret Dunn, who was brought up in this lovely little quiet household. And my sponsor just says to me, now, Margaret, we're going to talk about sex. I want the ground to open up and swallow me, but this part of the inventory is dealt with like any other part of the inventory. These are the things that affects us. The resentment, the fear, the sex. And this is where I fell down again. My sex inventory, I wasn't honest. And what happened? 
I drank again before I did this properly, before I followed the clear cut directions. We treat this like any other imagery. There's a paragraph on 69. Um, which tells us we reviewed our conduct over the years. It's not the act of sex. It's not who we were with, where it was, nothing. It's our conduct in relation to sex. How I was selfish, how I was dishonest. Again, how I was resentful um, in my conduct around sex and how I use my own femininity to, you know, manipulate people and be self-seeking and all of that. My conduct, I couldn't believe it. I identified the fact that I'd never been faithful in my life. How could I have not seen that before? Because these blocks were covering every single thing up. And as I went through this inventory, it was stripped back, stripped back, stripped back. So now with the sex inventory done, completed and out of the way, no secrets anywhere there because you know what? God is the only arbiter of our sex, our sex life, our sex matters. And now what I have in my life is a sex ideal in the sense of what I want from a relationship, what, I, what I'm what i willing to give to a relationship, something that I had never done before in my life. And once we've completed these inventories, we've begun, we've only begun to comprehend their futility and futility. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We've begun to learn tolerance and patience. But now we've just made the beginning. Having gone through all of that, we've only made a beginning. And now we've swallowed 100% and digested large chunks of truth about ourselves. And now we need to get rid of them. When you go into your step five and have this long talk, it's not about regurgitating everything back up again so that you see everything and think, all right, okay, this is it. No, we digest, we swallow. There's only one way that that can go. We get rid of this. And we sit with another person, and I'm sorry for the graphic um, description of it, but basically that's what happens. We get rid of this stuff, haven't swallowed it and digested it. We've looked at the obstacles in our way. We've looked at the defects, and the defects are basically a lack of something. My defects are that I lack the power of God. I want to be your friend, but I keep running away. Lack of power is my dilemma. The nature of my wrongs. These are the controlling forces. The nature is the dishonesty. The nature is the self-seeking. The nature is the fear. And I have to then sit with somebody and have a long talk. And my own personal experience is, like it says in these pages, if we skip this vital step, we will drink again. We cannot skip it. We cannot hop over it. I thought I'd only lost my egoism. I only thought I'd lost my fear when I did this a couple of times prior to stopping actually drinking. I hadn't got the ability to humble myself. The great persuader had to do its work. It had to take me down, faced with a self-imposed crisis. Again, I have no other option than to accept this spiritual answer. And it gives us very clear-cut directions as to who we do this with. In the line that I come from, we do it with persons. And my last round, I think I did this fifth step and sat and admitted to God to myself and probably, I think, 16 other people. Um, because each time I did this in a group of three or four people, another stage character turned up. Another twist of my character turned up. I was able to see how I acted in front of different people. To say this out loud to all of these people just gave me a whole new, whole new, I don't know, just a whole, a whole new experience with God. We're prepared for a long talk. That's all this is. Don't be afraid of it. It's the most beautiful experience I've genuinely ever had in my life to sit with another human being, another group of humans, and hear their fifth step too. We're engaged on a life and death errand. And this time, without alcohol, the unmanageability of my life was going to kill me. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and therefore, I had to get rid of the blocks around that. And that's an extreme thing to say, but the unmanageability was starting to consume me. And I needed the God's help. Alcohol was but the beginning. The elimination of it anyway. I'm just going to turn this light on because it's getting dark. 
Sorry. So when I went into my step five, I had to pocket my pride. I still have my pride. I know how to deal with it now, with God's help. But I pocket it during these conversations and I go into this just illuminating. You know, in the, in the beginning, when I talked about going into that cave and we're searching in that cave for all of the blocks, it's now a different type of light. We're illuminating every twist of character. We're illuminating every dark cranny of the past. We're withholding nothing. And we're going in and just saying, this is me. I found out the facts. I faced the facts. This is me. And the only way that I can describe it is, and this is the first time around that I did it, but the interesting thing is the shape and the form of it has changed completely. And I now understand myself and God so much more. But through this process, when I launched, when I went into that cave, when I searched so fiercely, I did feel at points that I was broken into little bits. I felt as if it was like smashed into smithereens. And I mean this in a really positive way. And by looking at those little bits of colorful glass on the ground in front of me, somehow or other, with other people listening to this, I was able to piece those, those pieces of colored glass back together into this most beautiful mosaic that I can look at now and say, wow. And the first time round, I described it as this beautiful colored vase, but now I just see this most beautiful array of colors as to what life has become because I got rid of those blocks. I no longer harbor a resentment that I've held for a significant amount of time. And the release from that, the freedom from that, has had me catapulted into this way of living that I sometimes find really difficult to articulate. Because I thought that what I was doing and controlling the show was going to give me the best life possible. And when I put my life in the hands of God, and followed the dictates of this higher power. Life is, has more meaning than ever before. And after every single one of those long talks, I sit and I take one hour by myself. And I take this book down from the shelf. And I reflect on the work done to this point. And I almost relive this journey that started at step one. And I look at the foundations. I make sure that I carefully look at these directions and carefully is to make sure that we're painstaking, that we don't avoid, we, that we avoid any omissions, that I make sure that I've done everything to the best of my ability that I can with the grace of God, that I understand this illness that I understand that I'm an alcoholic, that I have admitted that I'm alcoholic. I understand the allergy, the mental obsession, the spiritual malady. I look at step two and understand that that cornerstone is in place. Is there anything that I have admitted there that God has returned me to sanity in relation to that? Simply because in that last line of we agnostics, when I drew near to him, he disclosed himself to me. And in, I, in step three, the keystone, have I made that decision? Have I truly handed my will and my life over to the care of God? Do I still understand that I'm no longer running the show, that he's the father, I'm the child, he's the director and I'm his agent? And being his agent, I'm employed by him to do his work well. My little plans and designs no longer matter. That I am here to play the role that he has assigned in order for me to be more useful to as many alcoholics as I can be for the rest of my life. And having reviewed those first five proposals, have I been as fearless as I could possibly be in admitting this, these wrongs, these blames, these mistakes? Have I admitted everything? Is there anything outstanding that is going to come back and come into my mind again and start to niggle at me? where I may continue to have this little bit of resentment. 
are all of those stones properly in place? Are my foundations solid? That archway to freedom, that archway that we're going to walk through, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Have I carefully followed the clear cut directions? Or have I tried to make this mortar without sand so that the foundations are weak and that the stones don't stay in place? And that for me is a really essential part of the fifth step. And I think it's often one that is overlooked, that that one hour by ourselves, where we sit in the presence of the God of our understanding so that we can get to know him better, whatever you choose to describe it, all-powerful, creative, intelligent, mother nature, spirit of the universe, just to sit in quiet contemplation, prayer, meditation, whatever you want to call it, to make sure we've done the work well. Because step six and seven, which I'm sure somebody will be talking about later on, is an essential and vital life-giving part of our program as well, where we become willing and ready to ask God to remove these defects of character that have been identified and come, come out through this entire process. Now, I don't know whether any of that has made any sense whatsoever. But for me, to sit here and talk about this with a group of other alcoholics is a humbling experience in itself. Because I don't always get this stuff right. And I take inventory every day in my step 10 because we know this continues for our lifetime but when I first came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous I thought I knew everything and the gift for me now is that I don't know anything really my friend Bob talks about the fact that the gift is the not knowing and every day I wake up not knowing what the day has in store for me I will be done, not mine. And that I can look the world in the eye, that I can be alone at perfect peace and ease, something that I was never able to do in my entire life. And as a result of doing this work, I do become more useful to my family, to my employer, my paid employer, although I'm paid with by God um, more than anything that um, money could possibly buy with this peace of mind, having recovered from this hopeless state of mind and body. And I think I'll finish on this. For anybody that's in the room that is apprehensive, doesn't want to get into that rocket, <laughs> doesn't want to get strapped in, in the first instance, when we first come into the rooms, I was told, it'll be okay, just take your time. Just take your time. We haven't got time. If you're an alcoholic and you self-diagnose yourself that you're alcoholic, there's no time to wait. You have to get into the action. You have to understand how hopeless this is. You have to understand that this is a progressive illness and alcohol once you did. So we have to take a certain simple attitude and a sponsor will take you by the hand and give to you what was given to me. And by the grace of God, I'm here to be able to talk to you, to humble myself enough <laughs> If that's even a thing to do, to say that I don't do this well every time, but I do make progress. I try, and it's only by working with other alcoholics that I learn more and more and more about this program, the importance of it, and that my responsibility pledge is the most important thing, my impo most important responsibility. So it's a fun journey. My sponsor and I in the group that we went through and did our step five with 
had many laughs, had many tears, had many tantrums along the way. That rocket was just the most amazing journey that I ever, ever had. And I will do it again pretty swiftly because there's more to be revealed. So I'll leave it at that. Ma'am, thank you so much. Sorry for rambling. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.